Welcome back to the OWASP Top 10 for 2017 and in A6 we are going to look at security misconfiguration which is basically a very broad brush of various things that need setting up correctly in applications but particularly on web servers, web server software and a number of things really across so many different areas that this isn't very easy to be specific in but I'm going to give you a few examples of what security configuration or good security configuration might look like and some examples of where we can kind of get this wrong. So A6 is interesting in that it is generally quite exploitable, quite common, quite easy to detect. But of course, what you can actually do with a misconfigured site kind of depends a little bit. So in some ways, even if you can see something like the listing of a directory on a web server, which would be one example, or if your SSL is not quite up to date, what you can actually do with those vulnerabilities is perhaps quite limited. But of course, in some cases, you would be able to kind of take full advantage of the information that you want to get from that system or even to take control over that web server and then use that as a springboard into a, a larger attack. So the technical impact could be quite major, but in many cases, it's not usually quite so serious as things like injection attacks and misconfigured access controls. But really what we're talking about here is where certain security hardening or maybe permissions on an application or on a server are not set up correctly. So they might be missing completely. They might just be set to their defaults or they might be misconfigured in some other way, which allows an attacker to take advantage of usually some kind of backdoor. So this could take the form of unnecessary features or ports available on a system. So leaving things like maybe an FTP port open or a, even things like, say, NetTime ports, NetBIOS and Samba and things like that, which might be OK on a system that's designed to have those ports open. But if you kind of leave those things available to an attacker, then they can potentially take advantage of a service that doesn't need to be running or maybe just a vulnerability that exists on a very old service that you're running on a port on a server that shouldn't be running. Another classic, which happens particularly in hardware terms, so on routers, even on kind of Internet of Things devices, heating controllers, webcams, those sorts of things. Having a default account where the password is the same on every single device as it leaves the factory obviously gives an attacker a chance to kind of take advantage of that on your particular instance of that device. But also things like error leakage, so giving too much information out to the user when something gets uh, broken or when something falls over. When you get security features on newer frameworks, which is kind of left dis disabled or maybe misconfigured. So, for example, imagine you, you were running a, a system on an old version of .NET and maybe you update .NET to a newer version, which has some new features. But because they maybe stop your site from working properly or because you're not really aware of these features, you might leave them switched off or you might not understand enough to configure them correctly. So you leave them turned off, or you leave them misconfigured. But also things like the configuration of web applications and server frameworks. So Nginx, Apache, .NET, you know, your Ruby's, Yi framework, you know, Zend, but, you know, whatever it might be, there are often configuration settings which can make your application secure. But for different reasons, these are not always enabled by default because maybe they cause a problem. They cause uh, a problem with functionality or a, a feature. So they're not always switched on. If you don't know that they exist and you don't switch them on, then you can have a configuration that's maybe less secure than it could be. So um, in terms of web server security headers, there are a number. We'll look at some examples of those in a bit. But the idea that you can send a security header to tell a browser to kind of behave in a more secure way. These are usually fairly easy to implement. But again, if you're not aware of them, 
if you don't know exist or if there's a reason that you can't switch them on or configure them in the way that you want to obviously that can leave you exposed this is probably a, a kind of a fringe area because in most cases what an attacker can do with that might be limited but if these things are easy to switch on why not switch them on and make the attacker's job much harder and then a another actually another entry in the top 10 list but it's worth mentioning here is using vulnerable components in conjunction with insecure configuration can obviously leave you exposed so an example would be you're using an old version of apache an old version of nginx an old version of iis and that actually has a configuration that is maybe insecure by default whereas using a, a less vulnerable version might have that feature enabled by default so there are lots of things here lots of different uh, basically features many of them are on web servers but not exclusive to web servers we are also talking about web applications we're also talking about network infrastructure in general so in terms of how common this is obviously this is quite a common issue simply because it covers so many different areas of a system so your web application itself might be developed very securely but maybe the deployment process is weak or maybe the way that your network equipment is set up and configured is inconsistent so sometimes it might be good sometimes it isn't good so really the chance of your entire system being secure is quite low just because we're talking about so many different elements and again my kind of my own experience and i think the experience of owasp is that automated deployment is still not really being used in every single organization obviously it is being used in some organizations but when you lack that automated deployment then what you lack is consistency and i don't know about you but there have been many times where i've set up say a new nginx web server and i'm kind of trying to find out how do i set up ssl securely what settings should i be using how do i disable old versions of ssl how do i make sure the automatic redirects are there the security headers are there and because I'm doing it so many times, I'm probably doing it better on some days than I am on other days. Whereas if I had automated deployment where I could click a button and use the same recipe every time, then obviously I can get that consistency and I can make sure that over time I keep that deployment process secure. So some of these things can be found by automated test tools. We'll again look at some of those in a second. Uh, but, you know, in general, we can't assume that every single misconfiguration is discoverable. We need to kind of have that kind of professionalism, that awareness of what's happening, of where vulnerabilities are being found. And we need to be consistently monitoring our own deployment processes, our um, code reviews, our just development process in general and network management our monitoring our logging all of those things are part of the bigger picture and we need to be kind of professional enough to be finding areas where maybe something used to be okay but now it's not okay anymore because of a new vulnerability a new type of attack whatever it might be now as we kind of already said this does exist across many systems and many different forms so we need to be aware of that this isn't just a developer issue and in fact in most cases it's probably less of a developer issue more of a deployment issue but particularly with devops becoming more of a big deal having developers being able to push stuff into a system which gets deployed immediately to perhaps production or to a testing platform we need as developers we need to be aware of these but we also need to recognize that this also exists for the people who build and maintain our production platforms as well but on the other side of this it's obviously worth noting that not all vulnerabilities are as serious as others because you know having maybe ssl version 3 enabled would not be the kind of thing that would be recommended for a new system is it a very serious or a critical vulnerability probably not because the kind of resources somebody would need to attack ssl version 3 are still at this point in time very significant so okay maybe we're vulnerable to a government attack is that a problem probably for most of us not so much but that's not to say that we shouldn't always be striving for best practice and now that most browsers people are using support tls version 
you know, 1.1, 1.2, 1.3. Do we still need to support SSL? Probably not. But we mustn't think that every single way we misconfigure our site might be a, a critical vulnerability that needs to be addressed right now. But we, you know, we also need the, the ability to accept that there are many areas in which these things exist and we need to consider them from a risk point of view. So let's look at one example of a, a misconfiguration. In most cases nowadays, very few applications need directory listing enabled. Now, what we're talking about here is we're talking about, say, a site. So I've got a site in IIS, the default website. I've configured it to enable directory browsing. So I've got that enabled. I can switch that off. And the obvious problem with this is, well, if I can see a directory browsing, then I can start kind of digging through directories and I might be able to find something that is not designed to be read by a human being, like a configuration file. Now, in the case of IIS, if I click on web config, that file's actually going to be hidden because IIS knows that web.config is an important file and it won't show it to the browser by default. I'd have to do some work on that. But of course, there could be lots of things in here. There could be Git repository folders. There could be backup files. Uh, there could be configuration files. I mean, if I had a web.config.backup, I probably would be able to read that. And then the attacker could potentially read things like passwords and connection strings and stuff like that. Now, this is a, a pretty simple example, but in most cases, directory browsing is disabled by default. But it's one of those issues where, well, if we've got old sites, if we've got lots, maybe tens or hundreds of production websites, do we know that directory browsing is disabled on all of them? And how do we know that? And how do we know that when we deploy a new website, whether it's Apache, IIS, Nginx, or another kind of web server, how do we know that directory browsing is disabled like it would be here to say you can't browser directory you need to actually you know select a specific file and obviously in this case the reason this works is because I'd actually removed index.html as a default file which in most cases you know that's actually what would happen if we try to go to a directory but directory browsing is one of those things where you know it can kind of give the attacker a lot of information it's generally only a problem on older websites but that's just one example of where we need to make sure that our configuration is correct and that we know it's correct and that our deployment processes and our new website and new web server processes are going to make sure that that's disabled so here's another example, Nginx configuration. So this is a local site I've got running on a Raspberry Pi. In this case, I have the port 80 redirecting to port 443 for SSL, which is great for HTTPS. And, you know, kind of I've got things like the strict transport security header here, which is great. I've got all the SSL stuff set up here. But then you know, there's a lot of really quite complicated configuration. I've got an SSL cipher list. I have, you know, I tell Nginx to use my preferred ciphers. I've got my own Diffie-Hellman parameters that I've generated, all the rest of it. But this is not really very user-friendly. Even if you're a technical person, there's a lot of information here that you're not necessarily going to understand. You know, what should be in my SSL cipher list? Does this change over time? How do I know when it changes? How do I know whether I need to update this list and remove some of the older ones that are maybe not important anymore? So this is kind of um, the, you know, the, the sort of thing, oop, need to log out, the kind of thing where, you know, maybe it's not a developer issue depending on the size of your company. Maybe it, it's a uh, an IT kind of support issue maybe it's a deployment issue maybe it's a team that just looks after nginx configuration but you know that's the sort of detail that somebody in your organization needs to understand in order to make sure that we're hardening our web server configuration okay so detailed errors is another example so we go back to our kind of bank account application this is example one we've seen this before and this was one where we're using SQL injection and stuff like that. But one of the examples that we demonstrated on here is, you know, what happens if we go to our bank accounts page and we try to install one that has, a, you know, some some kind of syntax error in it like this. And OK, this is running in the debugger, so it's going to kind of error 
in Visual Studio. Um, oh, sorry, that didn't work because I had some stuff in here I wanted to do, I think, something like this. Oh, sorry. Create account. Um, so if I am not running in a debugger, then this is an example of detailed error information that's telling an attacker more information than they should be able to see. So in here, we're seeing all kinds of stuff. We're getting a very specific error. We know that we're using SQL. We kind of realize some stuff here. If I actually expand this, we can actually see code, which definitely we should not be showing to an attacker. So an attacker looking at this is going to go, brilliant. I can see exactly what they're doing. I know exactly why it's falling over. And now I can probably find all kinds of ways of attacking this information. So detailed errors, we need to turn them off. Again, they're usually turned off by default in a production deployment, but we need to check that. We need to make sure that's happening and we need to um, attempt as far as we can to make sure that our deployments, uh, especially automated deployments, but new deployments, new environments, we need to make sure that this isn't going to be turned on accidentally by somebody trying something out. We need to make sure that we, we've got some mechanism to check that our detailed errors are turned off or in this case we could do something in code to make sure that we don't just dump the error to the top level so detailed errors is another example now when it comes to things like you call it ssl labs but you know https this has kind of become more of a big deal recently. We've been kind of saying, actually, we're starting to take this more seriously. We don't want to be running old versions of SSL. Most browsers don't need to run an old version anymore. They support TLS, which is a more up to date, more kind of modern and secure mechanism for securing pages. But how do we actually know this? Because this is quite hard. It's quite uh, complicated. It's quite a, a low level kind of concept. Most of us just want to be able to flick a switch and have it all working. But the good news is we've got, you know, people like Callis make SSL Labs, the website, SSLLabs.com. And here I can run um, this system automatically against my website. And it's going to tell me all kinds of stuff. Am I using the right certificates? Um, this one's actually shown because I run another website on that same server, but that's not important. But it's kind of telling me things like, you know, SSL 3 and 2. Now, I've got those disabled, but if they were enabled, I would get an error here. And I usually have some kind of link. So you can, um, with some of these things like, uh, where do we go? Um, like this kind of stuff. It's going to say, well, public key pinning, is it enabled? It's not enabled. But if I want to know what that actually means, I can click on here and it's going to tell me what is public key pinning. Is it important? Do I need it? Is it going to get me a better score? So I've scored an A, which is pretty good, but you can get an A plus if you use all of the mechanisms. Is A good enough? Probably in most cases. Is A plus better? Probably you know, if, if it's a case of actually spending a few hours doing this work and it doesn't break my site, why wouldn't I want to use, you know, latest Cypher suites, latest versions of TLS, um, you know, making sure that I support most modern browsers. Do I care about IE8? Probably not. Do I care about old versions of Java? No, I definitely don't. Do I care about old versions of Android? No, I don't. But as with most things, this can be a balance of do I support older browsers, older devices? Do I care about that or not? If I do, I might have to lower my level of security. But the nice thing here is I can see loads of information. You know, am I vulnerable to heart bleed? What does that even mean? You know, click on all the links. And, you know, this is a free site. In return, obviously, SSL Labs get to kind of understand lots of things about sites that are being run through this um, through this test tool but it just gives me an easy way to say well I don't really understand most of what these things mean so I can just run this tool and if I want to know why I've got an orange mark there for DNS CAA I can just click on it and I can find out what that is so that is another example of security configuration with um, HTTPS and another one is security headers so security headers to IO which was put together by Scott Helm in the UK, is just a simple way of saying, look, there are security headers that your web server software can send back to the browser to give you some extra protections 
against things like cross-site scripting, against iframe kind of abuse, and, you know, things like making sure that HTTPS can't be bypassed by somebody kind of trying to downgrade the connection to plain HTTP and then using in that to kind of man in the middle attack your site. So another site is free. You can go on there, kind of scan your site, and it can tell you whether you're missing a header. And most of these are pretty easy to add to your web server software. Uh, they can often have static values. So in my case, I can have XSS protection set to yes and block anything that looks dodgy. And in most cases, that's going to work. If on your site that doesn't work, you can you know may maybe make a decision to not have that header in place. But in most cases, these are very easy to implement. They cost you nothing and they just give you some extra levels of security. Um, and maybe it's not going to block anything on your website. Maybe your website's already secure. But, you know, if there is one day where you deploy something incorrectly and you deploy a vulnerability, it's kind of nice to know that the browser is giving you some extra kind of backstop protection against that. So security headers is kind of the last example of an area in which your configuration is kind of important to uh, to keep your site secure. Now, in terms of how to fix it, really, we're talking here about consistent process. And this is a recurring theme through the whole top 10, having a consistent process, in this case, for server and application hardening. But this is consistent process for development, for code review, for deployment, for, you know, what happens over time. The, you know, the hardest thing to manage is well, what happens in six months or one year or 18 months you know, how do I reevaluate my server configuration? How do I reevaluate HTTPS? How do I reevaluate server headers? But having that consistent process in place, which means that if I do see something that happens in the real world and I realize that I need to adopt, um, or I need to modify my process to take account of that new vulnerability, I should be able to do that in one place. And that one place should be able to actually affect my entire organization. So where is your consistent process? Even if it's a checklist, even if it's 10 things on a piece of paper, having something that makes sure that once you've learned a vulnerability, you're going to put in a control every single time from now on to protect against it. The Also, the idea of starting with kind of minimal functionality, and this is something that I think the industry has got better at over time, is rather than having, say, IIS, Apache, Nginx, whatever it is, having everything switched on by default to make your site work out of the box, is saying, well, actually, let's have all the features switched off. Let's have default accounts turned off. Let's have the examples turned off. Let's start with nothing and then only add in each feature as we need it to be added in. And a good example of this is with a content security policy, which is a server header to tell the browser which resources it is and isn't allowed to load. Now, the nice thing about a content security policy is when you're first setting it up, you can just start with self, which means you can only load resources from the same domain as the one that's hosting the site. And then you can run your site up and see if it works. You can go through all your different pages and then maybe you come across a place where it says, actually, I need to load this font from Google. So then you go back into your content security policy, you add Google as a font source and then you go through your site again. And then you find that one of your scripts is in line. And so you need to add inline scripts to the script source. And just by building that up bit by bit, you can make sure that you only have a very minimal content security policy, which, again, it's not necessarily going to stop anything just by itself. But it means if you make another mistake somewhere, the content security policy is the kind of the backstop that's going to say, no, actually, I'm going to stop that thing from happening and you know make you think about what it is you're doing making sure that you know whether you should be loading something from a different domain or whether you need to do something in a slightly better way but a, like i mentioned before one of the most difficult things is the the kind of the regular consideration so you know something comes out ransomware comes out heartbleed comes out you know apache struts has a vulnerability that suddenly 
um, affects everybody in the whole world. You know, how are you going to do that? Because that's very difficult. That's almost like saying, well, I need to find the websites that I can visit that are going to tell me about these new critical vulnerabilities so I can immediately and proactively decide, is this something that I need to care about for my organization, for my software, for the issues that I face? And if it is, how do I modify my process to say, right, first of all, I'm going to have to go around all my web servers and maybe change some configuration. But also maybe I then need to change my new environment deployment process to make sure that, you know, I, I'm not vulnerable to Heartbleed. I'm not vulnerable to ransomware, you know, whatever the vulnerability might be. And kind of a, a, just a general good control for, for all of these, well, almost all of them in the top 10, is to make sure that you have good segmentation of systems because segmenting your network using firewalls between different segments is a nice easy way to say, well, even if I have misconfigured something, if I, let's say, have a vulnerability where somebody manages to read the contents of a configuration file via the browser, well, good segmentation means that the chance of an attacker being able to take advantage of that gets reduced because even if they see a connection string, they might not be allowed to actually connect to that database because the connection is locked down to only a particular system. So segmentation is a good way of kind of hardening, giving you that defense in depth, which yeah just makes your systems more secure right across the board. And then also using some of those automated and on online server checks. So I've shown you the SSL Labs uh, server test. I've shown you securityheaders.io. But there are other automated tools. There are, you know, hacker tools like the, the sorts of things you get in Burp Suite and stuff like that, which you can run against your software. And it can even tell you things like you're running an old version of Nginx, you're running an old version of Apache, those sorts of checks which can give you just a very quick and a very easy way of saying you need to go around and update those and the more you can automate that the easier it is for you to go in you know every monday morning for example and just hit your go button and have it scan all of your production systems and say oh that system over there that runs the help desk or whatever is you know has an update available you should go and update it and you know make sure that you have the ability to do that because it, it might seem a a silly thing to say but I, I found many organizations who simply don't have the practical ability to quickly and easily update something and we saw an example the other day with o2 using uh, a load of equipment from um i can't remember maybe ericsson or nokia or somebody and it was simply a you know a server certificate had expired and the whole data network suddenly stopped working on you know o2 mobiles in the uk and, you know, that's the kind of example of, well, how do we go and update these systems? We should be able to click a button and it should just work. But of course, if you can't do that, if you're going to have to send somebody to every data center in the entire UK to plug something into a box, to run up a, a terminal, to do whatever, then you already have a problem. So the more we can automate these updates, the better, you know, leave your, your Linux automatic security updates, your Windows critical updates all enabled and, you know, allow as many of these things to be done automatically as possible. But, you know, when there is a vulnerability, you do need to be able to update it as, um, as soon as possible, ideally within a matter of minutes or hours and not days or weeks. So that's it for this video. You know, please read the top 10. There's a link down there, OWASP top 10 project at OWASP.org. There's, you know, other stuff in there. There are pointers to other resources, to cheat sheets, to the application verification security standard and other tools that OWASP can do. But, you know, just keep getting out there, keep reading um, the websites, keep going to the CV databases and just get an eye of what's going on. You know, reduce the amount of stuff you're using because that just makes it easier to manage. Automate as much as you can and get those consistent processes in place so that the more you can automate things, the more you can have the assurance that you're getting the same secure configuration every time you're deploying something. So thanks very much. We'll see you in the next video.